This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Only last Thursday, as evidence of this rapid offensive buildup was already in my hand, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko told me in my office that he was instructed to make it clear once again, as he said his government had already done, that Soviet assistance to Cuba, and I quote, pursued solely the purpose of contributing to the defense capabilities of Cuba, unquote. That, and I quote him, training by Soviet specialists of Cuban nationals in handling defensive armaments was by no means offensive. And that if it were otherwise, Mr. Gamico went on, the Soviet government would never become involved in rendering such assistance, unquote. That statement also was false. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a very traumatic event for uh, Canadians as well as Americans. And I remember that very, very well because uh, I was working for the Montreal Star at that time and I was yanked out of my ordinary routine of assignments in Montreal and sent down to New York to cover the debate that occurred in the United Nations. So it was a very exciting time for me, of course, as a journalist. But it was also quite terrifying because uh, on the one hand, on a journalistic level, I was caught up in the story that was unfolding at the United Nations, listening to Adlai Stevenson and other American and Soviet leaders uh, display aerial photographs of missile sites in Cuba, uh, aerial photographs of Soviet ships traveling towards Cuba with the missiles supposedly in boxes, large containers on, on the decks, and a tremendous amount of brinkmanship that was going on in the United Nations at that time. Then I would walk out of the UN building to go to my hotel in New York, and I'd become aware of the fact that I was also living at that point in the number one target area in the United States, and it was quite terrifying. Uh, there were bomb shelter signs on many of the public buildings in the U.S. We, we didn't see that in Canada. We had air raid sirens uh, that were on the rooftops of buildings, but we weren't nearly as uh, prepared. Americans were digging bomb shelters and fallout shelters in their backyards at that time, and a few kooky Canadians were doing the same thing, but not, not nearly to the same extent. But it was terrifying for Canadians because they felt caught up in this and they didn't have any control. In fact, I remember writing at the time in the Montreal Star, that when I went down to New York, in a sense, it wasn't quite as alarming because Americans were caught up in this confrontation with the Russians and they were very, very aggressive and there was a kind of, uh, we're going to beat those guys. So there was a kind of excitement. In Montreal, there was just sheer terror because we weren't fighting the Russians, but whatever the Americans did was going to affect us if, the, if there was a, an outbreak of nuclear war and the Soviets started to fire missiles at New York, Canada would be finished at the same time. So in, in that sense, it was almost more terrifying. The whole world was sort of focused on the Cuban Missile Crisis. The so they they feared, feared nuclear war. It, it was really close to it happening. And when finally it, it didn't happen, the U.S. public was just so overjoyed that, you know, they, they, they survived. They, there was no nuclear war and everything. So the president just looked really good. I think they were probably pretty even, but if they had Cuba, they could launch missiles that would go really far into the U.S. interior, where the U.S. didn't really, they had some, I'm, I'm sure they had some nuclear capability in Russia, but not to the extent of that, because from Cuba they could hit 80% of large U.S. cities, and uh, so if, if they had got the missiles on Cuba, it really would have shifted the balance. It, Castro, but the reason that the U.S. started to really, really fear him was the U.S. Had, had a trade ban on him because they, they didn't like his new regime and they didn't like the way he did things. So he just he turned to the Russians and he said, look, I've got to sell all my goods. And they, they, of course, took it. So they feared him a lot as a sort of Soviet supporter. Like, they gave Cuba, like, little arms. But they, didn't, they certainly didn't set up nuclear weapons there or things like that in, in the 60s or, or any other time. They didn't, they didn't set up nuclear weapons on Cuba because it was too much of a, 
confrontation with the U.S. because it's very threatening to have them 80 kilometers off U.S. borders. They had sort of their bluff called in Cuba, and I think they, I think both sides were pretty, pretty shooken up about it. I mean, the Russians kind of talked tough and and you know re really scared a lot of people in North America, but they they must have pretty pretty fearful too. I mean, they they could have had nuclear weapons placed on them. Now, given the fact that the uh, so-called Cold War has come to an end and the uh, prospect of nuclear holocaust, uh, I assume, is not something that people go to bed worrying about anymore. Uh, again, as time passes, the whole prospect of that fear is probably starting to dwindle a bit. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's worthwhile for young people today to talk to people who actually experienced it. Uh, now, I was very young at the time, attended Ealing Public School here in town. And I recall them doing the drills with us, get under your desk, cover your head, and so on, just in case. And uh, essentially, when kids today hear us tell them things like that, I think it sort of drives home the message. And uh, Mr. Deborah, who spoke earlier, uh, talked about bomb shelters and all that, you know, contingency plans and so on. Uh, when we sort of, you know, exposed them to that, that that was a kind of hysteria that was present in a lot of people's minds. Yeah, they, I think they can appreciate it. But uh, uh, again, uh, I, do, I wouldn't want them to live through the same thing once again, but uh, uh, I don't think they really, really can appreciate it as much as someone who is there and lived through it. The Kennedy leadership style is what I would term the 11th hour kind of crisis management style, which was very popular at the time. Uh, if a leader today tried that approach, however, we, uh, we certainly would criticize him or her and say, oh, poor leadership. You know, there's no room for this kind of style of leadership. But at the time, it was seen as, a, as, as the style of leadership that uh, was decisive, uh, was the stuff that uh, was the right stuff to use an American phrase, so to speak. And uh, when uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was at its height, the world, including Canadians and Americans, were watching on the edge of their seats, hoping, well, he'll work it out. Something will come of this. Uh, you know, there's a fear, but it'll all, it'll all work out in the end. He saved the planet by halting the Cuban Missile Crisis. He saved everyone from the brink of Armageddon destruction. He was the person who led them through the Red Sea, parted the sea, and led them to their salvation. We should give Khrushchev credit, not Kennedy. <laughs> that was my conclusion. I mean, Kennedy waited and, until he got you know, the letter um, from Khrushchev. He, uh, he, was, he was waiting to uh, you know, press the button. And that, that worries me. That's the one thing that uh, I really didn't, don't like about the whole thing, because I think he's given a lot of credit when it actually came from the other side. The first concession came from the other side. Stalin was so, such a frightening person. He was just evil. And I think um, the Americans reacted, first of all, through, well, McCarthyism. That was the first kind of step. And then after they kind of got over the whole witch hunt thing, um, maybe this was the second kind of reaction to it. Because, I mean, Stalin's legacy lasts even today. I mean, it's, it's just, it was scary, and it was scary to the American people. And, and Kennedy, his hands were tied in the Cuban Missile Crisis because he had to uh, kind of look out for the best interests of America. Canadians were quite confused in their response to that. Uh, Diefenbaker hung, hung back a little bit and tried to assert a Canadian military independence for a while. And I think Canadians uh, partly like that, but the tradition of Joining forces with the Americans in a, in a wartime crisis was still very strong in Canada. And I think when Diefenbaker finally realized that he had to throw in his forces, his energies with the Americans, the Canadians generally tended to support that as well. I don't think uh, younger people today understand quite how frightening all that was. Now we tend to look back on the Cold War as a comfortable era when the Americans and the Soviet Union sort of resolved their political problems. But there were moments during the Kennedy years when it looked like they might not and when it looked like Armageddon was just around the corner and uh, when it looked like there wasn't much point in talking about the future because there might not be any future.